Well, it's good to be back. I see things haven't changed much since I left. We've got just as many people outside as we do inside, so <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that because it's all about networking and friendships and, and coming together at CACO. But, you know, the, the uh, Kentucky General Assembly will convene on January the 8th uh, next year, and it, it will be a short session, so it's going to be, you know, really quick, really fast, really hard. And so, you know, the one thing that we do have going for us, and you had kind of alluded to it, is we do have some momentum as local government up there. We've got a lot of legislators up there that are starting – to come up and that's got local government experience and that's good because they understand exactly where you're coming from and what your needs are at that point but we need a lot more help we need you to continue to stand up for all all of you all in this room that were re-elected congratulations for the ones who decided not to run and retire we thank you for your service and for all the new ones that are coming in that may be here in, in the session at this point we want you to get involved. We know that you're going to have your hands full as, an, as a new elected official, but take that time to reach out to KCO and other organizations and your legislator. Let them know what your needs are. You know, my goal has always been to help counties and cities out as much as I could by going up there, by taking my experience. Many of you know I served as county judge executive for Shelby County for 14 years. Before that, I was with the city of Shelbyville for 14 years. So I've got a little bit of both sides from city and county side, and it's like I told you know, the, the League of Cities, and also I told Keiko, we work together as a team. We don't fight each other. We have to work together to be strong because a lot of our cities are economic hubs of our counties, but our counties also support our cities very much so, and it, it varies from county to county and city to city at that point. But I also want to say that I want to send uh, the highest regards from Speaker uh, Osborne, who wished to be here today, but other obligations kept him away. He wished he could have been here, and he said he would be joining you soon as a lot of stuff's coming on. So let's talk about some of the issues that are, that are going to be coming before the legislator. And I like to look at it as this way. As local government chair, I, w I want to do everything that I can to save you money, and I want to do everything I can to help you raise additional revenues. Because as being a county judge, I know how tight it is out there, and I have not seen anything where the price has gone down. Have you all? on anything. So uh, that ranges from pension costs to personnel costs to road salt. Uh, and this year was just amazing on the road salt. I know I was talking to Judge Eisen uh, about what the cost of salt was, and I just can't believe what the cost has gone at this point. And we just had our first little touch of it at this point. But one thing we're really watching closely is the Kentucky Supreme Court and what, they're, and what their ruling is going to be on the pensions, because that really has an effect on you, because as you know, we, uh, we're, we tried to address the pension issue, the long-term uh, liabilities out there, but we also passed a bill in similar fashion that addressed the pension phase-in. So we're watching that very closely on how the Kentucky Supreme Court's ruling is going to affect not only the pension, but also the pension phase-in. Uh, one of the bills that you're probably going to be seeing out there that's going to be dropped in, that's going to be a lot of discussion, is on sports or fantasy sp uh, gambling out there. You know, it's already happening in Kentucky, whether you like it or not. The only thing we're not doing is regulating it and collecting money off of it. So you're probably going to see that bill continue to move forward, and then hopefully we can capture some of those revenues that we can later, you know, share with our local governments at this point. Uh, Speaker Osborne has already dropped in a piece of legislation that would clean up uh, the taxation on nonprofits. That was part of the tax reform package that kind of just slipped through the uh, goalie, as they say, in a hockey game at that point. So that's going to be one of the first bills you're going to see. So if you've got any nonprofits that are back in your communities and they are there and they help you out tremendously taking care of the homeless to helping other uh, agencies and, and individuals that are in need. So we hope to take care of that. We continue to work on uh, with KLC and KCO on revenue streams for you all. Uh, we want to try to make as a legislator, or at least I do, but I know a lot of other legislators that are out there too, is we want to try to be able to give you the ability on the local level to have more opportunities to generate revenue. Uh, for, for far too long, state government has hamstrung cities and counties on their ability to raise revenue. We want to try to loosen that up a little bit, but that's a big bite that we're taking, and we're really going to need your help. And uh, I can tell you, uh, anybody from CACO is going to tell you, you have to stay in contact with your legislator. Just real quickly, how many of you in this room, just raise your hands up real quickly, have talked to your legislator in, in the last year? Every hand should be up. Every hand should be up, and you should be telling him exactly what your feelings are. You know, we're going to be talking about the road formulas coming up again. You've heard a lot from KCO about the road formula. You know, cities are wanting one thing, counties are wanting one thing, the state's wanting money. Everybody's wanting money out there. But we've got to make sure that you and KCO stay very close to your legislator to let them know exactly what's going on. 
You know, I co-sponsored House Bill 609 last year, which would increase the gasoline tax, which would put more money back in the state, but also more money back in the counties. I was still county judge executive when they lowered that tax rate. And we took about a $500,000 hit that first year. Now, for a lot of you all, I know for sure that the county road aid money that you get, that's your entire road budget out there. And when you take that type of hit, you have no choice. It's either roads don't get salted, pers personnel positions do not get filled, so you had to make those hard decisions. So like we were talking about taxation, you don't want to have to do that, but that's one of those necessary taxes that I think that are out there. Go back and talk to your people in your community. I talked to everybody in my community as much as I could, and nine out of 10 of them told me, I don't have a problem with you raising gasoline tax. They told me that. We always got that one out there, you know, I don't want to tax anywhere. But I always tell them this story. I said, you're driving down the road and you hit a pothole and you blow a $400 tire and you bend a $1,200 rim and then all of a sudden you got a $250 alignment on your car, but you saved that two cents a gallon. So you think about that, that it really make a lot of sense. So when you kind of put it in that perspective, then it really, it really means a whole lot. And you've got a lot of help right here in your own organization. I'm looking out there, and Judge Imes is out there. And, you, and it wasn't just a few days ago, I was calling him Representative Imes uh, down there, and we talked about this. And uh, he is a wealth of knowledge for you, and I know you have other people in here that have served up in the legislature uh, that are now down on the local level. Use them because they know how to navigate around Frankfurt. They know who you need to talk to. You know, they need you know, when, to, when to push that button and when not to push that button. So use them at your biggest thing. Another bill that I am working on, uh, there's going to be more information coming out on it. Now, I'm very limited on my time. I only have 15 minutes because uh, the speaker after me, The Rock, is coming up here to speak to you right after I get done. You know, you thought it was Dwayne Johnson, didn't you? No, it's The, the Rock. Rocky Atkins is coming up. Rocky's a great person, and I'm glad I'm in warm-up act for Rocky at this point. But uh, one bill that I am working on that's going to be of particular interest to you is relating to emergency medical services and is trying to recapture more Medicaid and Medicare money back to your counties and cities at this point. So legislation is being drafted at this point, and there's going to be some participation from the counties and those counties that have ambulance services in order to participate. But we'll have a lot more information, and we'll break it down to you in a very simple format, but it is a, it is a win situation for you. Uh, but that's the key thing is trying to get you more money and working with the Kentucky ambulance providers across uh, Kentucky. Uh, they are on board, so we'll get that information out to you, and hopefully by sometime in the session we can get all that information to CACO and, and to their legislative board so that hopefully we can get your support on that. Uh, another bill that I've already pre-filed at this point, uh, everybody knows that anytime you put anything out for bid, if it exceeds $20,000, it has to go to that bid process, which has to be advertised, no less than seven, no more than 21. That's a $20,000 threshold. My bill would increase that to $30,000. Uh, now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but what it does is if you need to buy a pickup truck or you need to buy a police car, your options right now, you can go state contract price, which means if you're living in, in uh, western Kentucky, you may have to drive to central Kentucky because that's where the dealership is that has a state contract for that. Most typically, and what happens most often, is you want to try to keep that purchase at home. And that car dealer will tell you, I can match that price if you will give me a chance. So why should cities and counties have to spend two, three, five hundred dollars to advertise it in the newspaper when they know they can get the same price of the car at home? So this, what this will do is raise it up so that takes care of those police cars because they're about twenty-nine thousand dollars if you need to buy one or a pickup truck at that. Anything over thirty, you're still subject to it, but this will take it up there. And it's been almost twenty years since that's been adjusted. So I think it's time that we adjust that. We're going to continue to work on legislation for economic development. Uh, I think you're going to hear every speaker is going to talk about that, but it's our job to help you with economic development on, on your county because, uh, as we said before, economic development is raising money, not through taxation, but, it, but anytime we can continue to do that and get jobs in your community, it's a tremendous uh, asset to you. And the last thing that I'm going to say before I turn it over, and we're just about out of time, is we continue to work on school safety. You know, the uh, Speaker Osborne is put together, and President Stivers are working a group for school safety. Uh, they are meeting now to come up with recommendations. So we're hitting it on all three levels. If you were emergency management, you, you would say that we have the response phase, we have the prevention phase, and we have the recovery phase. Well, on the prevention phase is the school working group is, is they're working to see what they can do to help prevent, prevent these 
these uh, uh, incidents from happening and protect our school children. On response phase, I'm working with fire, EMS, and 911 so that we can continue to prepare our first responders uh, even better in case something does happen. Uh, with Homeland Security and 911, we're moving toward next generation 911, and you've heard about a lot of that. And John Holliday, the executive director of Homeland Security, is fully aware of we need to find an additional revenue source for 911 because many of your counties have it at that point. And then on the recovery phase, we passed legislation last time that would authorize mental professionals to, to, to work at schools and move in in case there wasn't an incident to, to recover. And uh, that's just a sampling of some of the stuff that you're going to see. Like I said, I only had 15 minutes before we turn, turn it over to uh, Representative uh, and Floor Leader uh, Rocky Atkins. But I will be glad to take one or two questions real quick before we and to keep you on time. Because the only thing standing between us and lunch is uh, 15 minutes. So, anybody have any questions? All right, good group here. I like that. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. I'm honored to be here and see a whole lot of familiar faces in this crowd. It's been a tremendous honor for me to have the opportunity to work with so many of you in this room. And I know we got a, a lot of new faces in this crowd as well that's here for your training. And congratulations to all of you who have been elected and reelected back to office to serve this great commonwealth. I couldn't agree with your sign more. County's the heart of Kentucky. It's been my honor to work with county officials all across Kentucky during my legislative career to have a chance to listen to those folks who are on the ground and in the trenches. Uh, I believe the best government in Frankfort, Kentucky doesn't come out of Frankfort, Kentucky. I think the ideas coming from the ground up from local governments to us is what generates good policy for all of us across Kentucky. Uh, I wanted to just speak on just a few uh, things this morning. Um, all of you know that session is just around the corner. We'll be getting started. Short session. We'll be there for four days in January. We break, come back for 26 more days in February. A session that moves along quickly, as most of you know, that have watched the General Assembly and how it operates and how it works. <clears throat> the individual before me that spoke up here, uh, Rob, is a, is a great guy. It shows that some of us can work across party aisles. Some of us work together on different issues that take place. I think people are expecting people over politics, and Rob and I have worked very well together. His expertise on local issues, uh, my opportunity to have served in the General Assembly for many years now has given, I think, really the fabric of what the General Assembly is all about. You know, in the House of Representatives, People there from all walks of life, some that have served at the local level, private sector, folks that have served in the military, lawyers, doctors, the real fabric of who Kentucky is and what Kentucky is all about. I would tell you that going into this session that it is important that you do something that Rob said to you. How many of you have talked to your legislator locally about concerns that you have in your county whether it be with your county budget, whether it be with the economic development opportunities, whether it be with infrastructure, whether it be with your jail, whether it be with 911, whatever those issues may be, I think it is of utmost importance. I can tell you here today that I'm not an expert on every issue, don't claim to be, don't want to be. But you folks are the experts in your fields, whatever it may be, whether it's so serving in local government and that expertise you bring from other parts of your life to that service. It is important that we hear from you, we know from you, that you communicate with us, and you make sure that we know the issues that KCO cares about. You have good people on the ground in Frankfurt every day. They're on the ground, they're working with us, they're staying in touch with us, but you folks are mobilized in a way that no other organizations are, or very few. I mean, when you take your county judges, all your local officials, folks that serve on the fiscal courts, you have a network of hundreds of people across Kentucky that can network together, singing out of the same hymn book, which I would say is important. You've got your own individual issues as counties, but the big issues, the big issues of jails, that is really hamstringing a lot of our counties across Kentucky. The big issues of you being able to raise your own local revenues, to be able to operate your local budgets back home. I was a big supporter of the lift 
proposal that came through the General Assembly, voted for it two or three times to move it through the House because I believe communities, regardless of your size, regardless of your size, should have the opportunity during these times to be able to think out of the box, be able to do your way of being able to raise those local revenues that you need to do the things that you want to be, whether it's a specific project, which that's what Lyft was, or whether it's a, an innovative idea that you may have at your local level that your community believes in and something that you want to move forward with. You know, public service is a tremendous thing. It's an honorable thing. It's something that I wouldn't trade for anything, the experience that I've had of being elected on my 26th birthday the first time I went to the Kentucky House of Representatives. The only member of my family to ever run for a political office. The only member of my family to be in public service, to be very honest, in this type of public service. We were in public service in a lot of other ways, helping our community, but I'm the only one to ever run for a political office. And I think political service, public service in the political arena is an honorable thing. And I'm proud of the service that you're getting ready to do, that you have done, and the good work that you're going to do in the future. We've got a lot of tough issues facing Kentucky. But something that is positive is that we're seeing some growth in revenue here in Kentucky right now. We're ahead of expectations, not by a lot, but at this point in time, we're up something like 3.5% from projections of the budget that was passed during this fiscal year. Kind of the bad news about that, the information we got from the finance cabinet, the group within finance that reported over the next quarters of this fiscal year, revenues could drop and we may come out about even. Well, we all know that we would like to see, first of all, the way we generate revenue is through growing economies, through creating jobs, for people going to work and paying taxes. That is the best way for us to be able to generate those revenues. But I think to think out of the box during these times, as I've said, during tough economic times when county governments are suffering from revenues, from local mandates that have been handed down from the federal government and from the state government as well, is something that is utmost importance that we do think out of the box together. Now, I've had the great honor of serving in many different capacities in the Kentucky House of Representatives. You know, I served as a member there before I became a member of leadership. And during that time, uh, I had the great honor, six years that I probably enjoy more during my public service than any other. I served on the Appropriations and Revenue Committee for many, many years of my legislative career. I got the tremendous honor of six years being able to write the, the economic development, tourism, and natural resource budget. You know, that, that was fun. That was a tremendous honor. But then leadership gave me the opportunity to be the budget chair of transportation, a $2.7 billion budget that stands separate from the general fund budget. And during that time, we were able to do some really good things. We put in a little line in that budget that basically said we're going to take money off of the shelf on projects that are not ready to move forward, and we're going to move that money off the shelf into projects that are ready to move forward. We turned the lettings in from a $500 million letting each year from the transportation cabinet with that one line of turning the transportation lettings into a $1 billion letting each year of the biennium. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, that means better infrastructure. That means people in the construction industry working and going to work, making good wages. That means that we're trying to build the infrastructure of the future to meet the demands of a 21st century economy with a 21st century workforce. We need to understand that if we want to compete in this global economy, if we don't have the type of infrastructure, whether it be water and sewer, and the ability to handle business and industry, whether it be roads and bridges that we need to make sure we move products in and out and it's easy for industry to locate all over this state, regardless of whether you live in an urban area or a rural area of this state. Infrastructure. Infrastructure is the key. Whether it's regional airports or whether it's river ports or whether it's railways to be able to move products in and out with the location that Kentucky has. 
During part of this budget time and after I became the majority leader, we started seeing revenues start to fall and there was a part of the statute that basically said the legislature must renew the wholesale price of gasoline at 32.3 percent, I think is what it was, 32.3 30, cents, something like that. We had a debate over that. And the wholesale price, if we didn't go ahead and renew that where it all, what already was, it was going to fall to 22 cents. Well, I'm here to tell you that we were able to pass leaving the 32 cents in place through the House of Representatives, but it didn't make it through the Senate. And since that didn't make it through the Senate, which started in 2015, we have lost $200 million a year out of the road fund. We must look at restabilizing the wholesale price of gasoline. We must do what we need to do to make sure that local revenue is coming back to you to be able to take care of your needs. Rob just said a half a million dollars he lost when that issue didn't get renewed at the 32 cents where it already was. It wasn't a tax. We were just renewing it where it already was. We have got, in my opinion, to find ways to stabilize this transportation budget in ways that will make sure that the local revenues that you expect, the monies that we need to put back into the current infrastructure we have, but the infrastructure that we're going to need in the future. We need your help. We need your help to make sure that that happens. I think it is of utmost importance. Now look, folks. There are certain parts of this state that are doing very, very well with its economy, with its jobs. But there are certain parts of this state that's not doing as well. And I believe that we've got to lift up all parts of this state for all of Kentucky to do well, to bring hope and opportunity, whether you live in the hills and the mountains of eastern Kentucky or whether you live in the farmlands of west Kentucky. We got to look at rural parts of this state along with urban parts of the state and figure out how we balance the economies for our people. To watch a depopulation of a region of Kentucky where I'm from is flat wrong. The downturn in the coal economy, and I stand here as one of those people that is a casualty of the coal industry. I lost my job with 1,200 people one day. And folks, my vision and my dream is to see us diversify the economy of all Kentucky, but diversify the economy of certain regions of this, of this uh, commonwealth that need help. And the way that we diversify that, and I'm going to get out of here before I start preaching to you, but here's what I'm going to tell you right now. We have an opportunity to do away with the peaks and the valleys of the economic distress of some of our communities and some of our regions of Kentucky. We have an opportunity to diversify and bring and advance manufacturing into all regions of Kentucky, but especially into those regions of Kentucky that need help. Why? Because we've invested billions of dollars over the years. Economic development is not an overnight deal. It's a 30-year investment. And we have invested over 30 years in roads and bridges and regional airports and infrastructure of water and sewer holding our railway system in place. we got to keep CSX and NS in eastern Kentucky to make sure we continue to have that railway system and those river ports to move product. So, folks, let me tell you something. Twelve years ago, I stood here, and I talked to you all about the U.S., America, needs to be energy independent. And people looked at me like I was crazy because we were importing 22 million barrels of oil a day when I gave that speech. And because of research and development and because of innovation, here we are today not only energy independent, but now we're an exporter of energy. Well, I'm going to stand here today and I'm going to talk to you about the diversification of an economy of all of Kentucky, but especially parts of Kentucky that need it the most. The number one export industry in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, it's not coal, it's not cars, it's not tobacco, it's not bourbon. The number one export industry in the Commonwealth of Kentucky <coughs> is the aerospace industry. An $11.7 billion export industry, we rank second 
in making the pieces and parts to build airplanes and rockets around the world only to Washington State that holds Boeing with their corporate headquarters. Folks, I have a vision and a dream that we have an opportunity to rebuild and diversify the economy in an advanced manufacturing that we never thought. Because in certain parts of our state, we have our universities like the Space Science Center at Moorhead State University, Eastern Kentucky University's Aviation School, a place here in Lexington called Space Tango that is graduating the workforce that is going to be needed for an industry that is going to need 350 to 500,000 employees over the next 15 to 20 years. My dream is to see Boeing, Lockheed Martin, or General Electric say, hey, we're going to the coal fields of eastern or western Kentucky, and we're going to build this advanced manufacturing to put these laid-off coal miners, these laid-off steel workers, these laid-off railroad workers, and these graduates coming out of school in an advanced manufacturing where they can make the type of wages to put food on the table and a roof over their head. I hope you have that same kind of vision because the game plan moving forward, working with local governments, your ideas, your vision is what we need to hear. Now, I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk, how much more, but let me tell you this. I'm here talking to you as the minority leader today. But I made a little announcement yesterday. I'm going to be traveling across Kentucky, and I'm going to be talking to you just like I have the rest of my career in the General Assembly. Nothing will change for me. All I want for us in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, regardless of where you live, is for our people to have hope and opportunity for our people to live where they were raised if they so choose, and for us to invest as a state government in the way that we need to invest to give our people, to give our people hope and opportunity and a better life all across this great commonwealth. Folks, I'm honored to be here with you today. I look forward to working with you in this upcoming session. I look forward to working with you as we make Kentucky the best it can possibly be. Thank you all for having me.